Hey, it's Katie. My channel is, is it just me? And today I want to talk about credit cards and the money that's on the credit cards, where it comes from and basically what my belief was behind it. And I want to strongly encourage you to watch the YouTube video down in the description. Uh, it's what got me my wheel spinning and made me create this. And I also hope that everybody would, I would encourage everybody to ask more questions and get involved. But this is super important and this is something that I wanted to share with you guys based off of this YouTube video that I watched that gave me some valuable information that got my wheels spinning about credit cards and how they make their money. But for me, I want to cover the process of what is the money on the credit cards. So let me start with my belief. My original belief about credit cards or debt or, you know, paying your mortgage, your, your loans or whatever was that this money was in a bank somewhere, that all of us are putting our money into banks, right? And they're holding our banks and keeping it safe for us. Well, I kind of always thought, okay, well, they, they loan out our money to make interest on that money. So I take, you know, I borrow money from the bank or a credit card. They have our money as a reserve. They loan it out. And then what keeps the doors open and playing the employees for the bank and the different people involved is the interest that they make. And I've always wondered, I'm like, how do they like, how do banks even stay open if that's the money that they have? It never occurred to me that it was something else. And we all hear it all the time on the news, but I want to break it down for me in such a more simpler, clearer way that just really is eye opening. So with that said, I, after watching this video, I ended up going on ChatGPT and asking questions, not because I believe everything that ChatGPT says, but the fact that I needed some basic in, information and I wanted to get my wheels spinning and looking at different sides and different things. So the very first question I asked ChatGPT, because again, the video in the description is something that got my wheels spinning was I asked the credit cards, the average person uses, is it backed by real money? And this is what ChatGPT said. No, the credit card, the credit available on a credit card is not up, is not backed by real money in a traditional sense of being fully reserved in the ca in cash by the bank. When you use a credit card, you are essentially borrowing money from the credit card issuer, and they trust that you'll pay it back along with interest and fees. The funds you use are created, made up as credit, which means they exist on an agreement between you and the bank, whether than being tied directly to money the bank has set aside for you. So again, just reiterating, it's made up, made up numbers. Banks are not required to hold a dollar for dollar reserve for all of their credit cards issued. So it led me to back, how can you say that it is borrowing when it is not an exchange of anything? Like they didn't have something actually to issue you. It's not backed off of cash or anything like that. So this is the specific question I asked ChatGBT. Why is it called borrowing when nothing is actually exchanged? The money is the money is made out of thin air. So the term, this is what it tells me. The term borrowing is used in credit card transactions, even though no physical money or tangible asset is exchanged because it is a convenient way to describe the process of obtaining funds that you don't currently possess with the promise of repayment. Here's a bigger breakdown of as why it is called borrowing, even though there's nothing exchanged, basically because it is an obligation of repayment. This mirrors the concept of traditional borrowing where you take something temporarily and agree to return it later. But it was a made up re item. I don't know. It is also a trust based system. Although the money isn't backed by something physical like gold or cash, it is a trust-based system. So if we don't believe in it, it honestly doesn't even exist. What gives it value is that we believe that whatever is on this credit card, all these zeros, is something that we're going to use and we're actually going to end up having to pay back with a shit ton of money on top. Sorry for cursing, especially if my mom sees this. Um, so... With that credit creation, when banks extend credit, they essentially create money out of thin air. It is a form of digital entries. Just so funny because if anybody has, has any background on Bitcoin, digital ent on entries come up and people are always like, oh, I don't believe in it. I don't believe in it. And it's like, meanwhile, we're all living on this system anyways. It's just ran and it's corrupt. But that's a whole different can of worms um, and a whole nother YouTube to get into. But 
This process is backed by the broader banking and financial system. The borrowed money doesn't physically exist until it is repaid back. But the debt is still a real obligation because we sign all these forms, we're gonna pay it back. But let me read that again. The borrowed money doesn't physically exist until it is repaid back. Economic impact. While credit extends purchasing power and stimulates eco economic activity, it also relies on the borrower's ability to pay it back. If people default on their credit obligations, the banks can face some real financial losses, showing that while the money is virtual, the consequences are very real. So there was this quote that I heard, and I'm really like, even though you hear stuff and you're like, oh, yeah, you don't fully understand all the layers to it until you start to dig down these different rabbit holes. But someone had said someone else's debt is someone else's asset. And these banks, they loan out this money and they show and they report back to these shareholders, these different numbers. And it's all contingent on the fact that we believe in it and we keep putting into it. And it allows the shareholders and these investors to make more money. Again, a whole nother video. So I'll try to stay away from that rabbit hole. Uh, so the next question I ask, I feel, this is what I'm asking ChatGPT. I feel like this shouldn't be legal. How can someone just make up money and expect to be paid back? It might seem strange that the money can essentially be created out of thin air and that we're expected to pay this, to pay back this made up money, but the system works due to several principles. Here are the principles, the nature of the modern money. Money itself is a largely is largely a symbolic construct. Historically, money was tied to tangible assets like gold and the gold standard. But today, most currencies are fiat, meaning their value comes from the trust of the people in them, whether than being backed by anything real and tangible. The economic engine. The ability to create credit is a crucial part of how our modern economic economies function credit fueled consumer spending, business investments, and economic growth. Without credit, many businesses wouldn't be able to expand. People wouldn't be able to buy homes or cars without saving for decades, and the economy would grow much slower. slower. And in my opinion, in a healthy way. These huge conglomerate corporations where you have these CEOs and these different people that are millionaires, billionaires, and we're probably gonna have our first trillionaire here this like this year or by next year, um, just doesn't seem right. When they're talking about they have more money than they could ever spend in a lifetime, just seems weird to me. Um, so let me see if I can keep connecting this a little bit because I do like my mind goes everywhere. Government and central banks regulate banks. Governments and central banks regulate banks to ensure that they don't have access, excessive amounts of credit. Do they? Do they regulate the banks? Um, with all the bank bailouts, is that the regulation? Is they get to make up as much money as they want and then when people can't afford to keep up with it, they get the bailout and not the people? Um, anyways, the value is in the debt. The promise to pay back is very real and is what has value. Trust and confidence in the system. The entire financial system is built on trust and confidence. When banks issue credit, they are essentially leveraging, leveraging the trust that individuals, businesses, and governments will honor their debt. As long as people continue to repay what they owe, the system remains stable. It, it, if trust erodes, such as during a financial crisis, then the system will falter, which is why regulations and safeguards exist. Again, government bailouts. So the next thing I ask is, I can understand how the system works because there's all this fluff, right? But it's not a fair system. It creates a one-sided society. One side creates while the other pays back. And so these, this is kind of what it says. The system legitimately rests on trust, regulation, and economic growth it enables. But that doesn't mean it's perfect or without challenges. The recent financial crises have shown that when mismanaged, 
the system can lead to serious issues, including widespread debt and financial collapse. Here's a breakdown of why the system might feel one-sided and how this dynamic creates a division in society. Wealth and power imbalance. Who benefits? Those who control the credit systems, banks, financial institutions, wealthy individuals benefit disproportionately from it. They can access larger loans at lower interest rates. Lower interest rates invest in assets that appreciate and earn income from interest. This enables them to build more wealth faster than the people without access to such resources. Who pays for this? On the other hand, individuals with lower income often face higher interest rates and fees, making it harder to pay off debts and save. This dynamic can trap people in cycles of debt while the wealthier classes continue to profit from the interest they collect on these loans. When you're having 29% interest on credit cards for the average American, I mean, how greedy do we have to be? You already made up the money and then you're going to make 30% on the money you made up. I mean, come on. Okay. So that was, so that's anyways, access to credit isn't equal. Systematic bias. Historically, certain groups, especially marginalized communities, have held limited access to credit and financial services. This can be due to re redlining, wage disparities, or predatory lending practices, like being in our colleges, giving out debt to people that haven't even had a chance to figure out life. They still don't even know like who they want to be or where they're going. With further which further entrenches the wealth inequality. The wealth gap between different demographics is partly a result of this unequal access to credit and the way like it's issued. You know, during the pandemic, they gave out stimuluses and everybody spent their stimuluses. I was driving at the time with UPS and we basically called it like it was peak season, Christmas time, because everybody was spending their stimulus on all this stuff because they were home. They were bored. They were buying fitness equipment, toys for their kids to entertain them because they weren't going to school. Um, there was tons of spending. I mean, we were inundated. We could not hire people fast enough. Um, and that money went back to these big corporations. And at the time, the same time that this was going on and we're getting stimulus, these huge institutions were getting 0% money. So they were able to take out millions of dollars and worth of money from the government or whatever, and they didn't have to pay interest on it. Could you imagine getting a home loan for a couple million dollars and buying multiple properties and then putting renters in those properties and then paying you that rent? You could pay off that money and still profit. Like, I, it's just crazy to me that that was even going on, but um, debt is a tool of control. Debt burden. For many, debt is not an empowering tool, but a burden. Students, for example, often accumulate significant amounts of debt in the pursuit of education. So not only do they get us with the credit card companies being allowed on college campus. Now this was a 97. I don't know if that's changed, but also the amount of people are having to pay to get an education and the education still doesn't even cover financial. Like, give me a break. Um, with repayment, uh, for example, often accumulated significant amounts of debt in the pursuit of education, only to struggle with repayment afterwards, which delays home ownership, savings, and investment. The rich, by contrast, tend to use debt strategically to invest in assets and grow, grow that grow over time, like real estate or stocks, allowing them to leverage the system to their advantage. If you haven't read the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Literally, he talks about poor people save money. Rich people get their money to make them more money and they leverage debt to make more money. So if you can buy a house for $100,000 and get a loan for that at 3% and you can put a renter in there and they're paying that payment and you're able to make, say you're making 6%, that's 3% profit. I totally butchered that, but just if you get a chance, read the read the book Rich Dad Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki, and he also has a channel which I don't I haven't listened to it in a while. He used to break it down a lot more fundamentally for me, and I know he's got he's bigger and he's got great like financial advice and different things. But he talks about debt and how the wealthy use it and how we basically it kills us. So the concentration of financial power. 
the role of central banks, central banks like the Federal Reserve and the U.S. control monetary policy, including the creation of money. These institutions operate in the interest of maintaining economic stability, but can sometimes prioritize the needs of large financial institutions over everyday people. For example, during the 2008 financial crisis, large banks were bailed out while many individuals lost their homes. This drives me nuts because we're the ones paying taxes. We're the ones that are voting these officials in and they're billing out these banks that have already saddled us with too much debt at too high of interest payments. And because they are basically printing money out of nowhere um, and then we go to need it, it's just a can of worms. Um, corporations and big banks. Big corporations and financial institutions have a lot of influence over how money flows in the economy. This concentration of power allows them to shape policies in ways that can increase inequality. For instance, financial institutions receive lower interest loans from the central bank, which they can invest at a profit while consumers oft often face much higher interest rates on credit cards and personal loans. Poverty trap. For those without wealth or access to affordable credit, Debt can be a trap. High interest loans, payday lenders, and credit card debt can eat away at income, making it difficult to save or invest. This is the cycle of poverty, where debt creates more debt and fewer opportunities to escape it. Financial markets versus real economy. Much of the wealth generated in the financial system comes from speculative investments, the stock market which often don't benefit the broader economy or regular people. Financial markets can grow and create wealth for investors while wages and job opportunities for regular workers stagnate. This, discon this disconnect between the financial system and the real economy deepens inequality. This is important to me because I work for a company that literally isn't reporting the fact that we are having massive layoffs. They're calling them temporary layoffs, which means they don't have to report those to the shareholders. And they don't want to report this type of stuff to shareholders because it can cause the people to believe less in the company, that the company might be struggling. And um, just the belief factor, if you start to believe, people will start selling. And the selling depreciates the stock and it's this endless cycle. And so these big businesses, like the stock market is so emotional. It's basically a huge beast of emotional betting. That's what it is, you know, and it's just like you have these different guys go on and talking about, oh, we're doing great or, you know, whatever it is and the con it will boom, you know, um, really pay attention to that because people are like, I don't understand the stock market. I don't either, but I'm really starting to realize it's just a strategic, like high end betting game. Um, that basically is super emotional, a lot more than I would have ever imagined. Uh, so there is an inherent imbalance in the financial system that disappropriately benefits those who access to who have access to capital and credit while placing a heavier burden on those without the system's reliance on debt and the way credit is created often ex exacerbates wealth inequality i'm going to stop here because there's so many more things that I want to talk about and I feel like I'm going to have to go back through this video because I think I left some dead ends and some things confusing and I probably said things where I shouldn't have said. So I want to touch base on that more and this is becoming a lot longer than I intended. So please check out my next video and a couple of different things I will talk about is who gives the banks this power? What's the difference between the government and the central banks? And what's the benefit of the government doing different things? So um, how do they make their money when if you look at their salaries, it's not that high. So there's so many more rabbit holes I want to go down. And anybody that took the time to listen, I appreciate it. And I'm sorry if some stuff was confusing. I'm working on getting a better flow um, to be a little bit more direct and informational. Um, I will always give my opinion because I want to hear yours. So if you have anything to add, um, I would greatly appreciate it. Please put it in the comments and have a great day.